Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The canary was historically taken by miners into the bowels of the earth while they dug perilously for coal. If the canary fell over in its cage, it meant something noxious was present and the miners were in grave danger. Ever since, the canary in the mine has been a metaphor for truth-tellers in a dangerous world. It is fitting, therefore, that by far the best new arrival in Britain's online journalism is the canary. Every day, it is breaking the stories that the noxious don't want us to know. I'm happy to say its co-founder and editor-in-chief, kerri Mendoza, joins us now on board the Sputnik. kerri first of all, I take my now absent hat <laughs> off to you. The canary is my go-to. Mm -hmm. I, I go to it before anything else in the morning. Wow. It's a fantastic success. Tell us how it began, whose idea it was, and what you hope to achieve with it. So it started, to be honest, as a conversation at a party. I'd been writing the script tonight, Daily Blog, for five years. By that point, um, we'd grown it to about a quarter of a million readers a month. Wow. Um, and, you know, we were bemoaning the fact that, you know, so much of the mainstream media has become dominated by a painfully narrow window of opinion. Essentially, if it's not neoliberal, it's not going to happen. Mm. Um, we were saying, you know, what if you had an alternative media outlet which was able to air those different opinions and speak in a human language that normal people, everyday people speak, um, and, and actually start to compete with those mainstream media outlets. So that's, that's what we did. Well, it's e there's never been a better time to be a journalist, but there's never been a worse time to get paid for it. Uh, how do the economics of it work? I mean, are you all working for nothing or what? Absolutely not. And this was really crucial for us when we set up, was to address the fact that most of Fleet, Re Fleet Street actually operates on the back of unpaid labour. You know, you have these unpaid internships that benefit, essentially, middle-class students, you know, graduates, which parents can pay for them to live in a London apartment for two years while they work unpaid. And it prejudices against all of the other types of people that might want to go into sure. journalism. So what we wanted to do was actually peg everybody's income from myself through to the newest writer to the overall financial success of the canary so we've got a revenue share model which means we divide the profits between the writers they get the lion's share which is 50 percent and the rest is split between the editorial team and ongoing costs and how are the numbers growing i mean i, I became first aware of it i don't know certainly in the last six months uh, and now I'm your most regular reader, or one of your most regular readers. Uh, what kind of growth have you experienced? It's been pretty exponential if we keep going the way we are. I mean, in July, we overtook The Spectator, New Statesman, The Economist. These are established. That's sensational. Fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, these, these are established. These have been around for more than a century. Completely. Yeah, with big money. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the real crucial thing. These, these organizations have you know, millionaire, billionaire backing. They have the, um, you know, the money of big corporations flooding into their um, coffers. We don't. You know, we set this up on an absolute shoestring. We didn't want to be funded by any corporation, state, individual or organization. So that everything we write is because we believe it. It's because we find evidence and we want to report it to people. It's not because anyone's paying us any money to do it or any loyalties that we feel to any political group or, or other group. And that gives us an astonishing level of, of editorial freedom um, because we don't owe anybody anything. Um, mm. And that was really, really important to us to maintain our independence. And we plan to keep doing that and to go you from see, you're scratch. You're the only people, I think I can say the only people, who are telling the truth about the labor leadership race, for example. Yeah. Not because you are slavish uh, supporters of Corbyn, but because you're telling the truth. <laughs> you're you're, that, you're not irony. falsifying, twisting, distorting, yeah. and even making up. I mean, 50% of all political journalism in this country, I can tell you after no, nearly 30 years in Parliament, is simply made up. 
Yeah. Somebody said something to somebody in a bar, and it's then written. Mm. So and that's what's that, that has helped your uh, cause, I think. It really has. People I are think, turning to you for yeah, news. Yeah, I think Pete, we have a level of trust with our readers, and that's reflected in our growing membership, because our goal was always to be reader-funded, ultimately. But we were an unknown quantity when we began, so we couldn't ask people to fund us from the get-go. Mm. So we've been growing our readership, growing our membership through this year. We've now got over 2,000 paying subscribers, and these people are not paying for paywalled content. They're no. not paying for a mug Actually, or a T-shirt. They're paying for right. something that I, I, they can I, I, get for free. Please include me. You've got 2,001. Oh, uh, my God, that's amazing, uh, George. Because I'm reading it for free, and that's not really fair, uh, because there's no corporates, there's no advertising. There's, uh, Although, by the way, what about this? The Huffington Post mm -hmm. was, for a small period, uh, an alternative go-to place. And then, of course, it became just another corporate, yeah. and its politics have followed suit. It's just another part of the big... Lie machine. Yeah. Uh, how are you going to avoid that fate? Well, we've kind of bootstrapped our morality in place. So one thing we have is that I have no say on the business side of the Canary, and the business side has no control at all over the editorial. So we put a firewall in place, which means those two <laughs> don't talk to each other. And we run democratically. So, for example, all of our writers are members of the National Union of Journalists. We're not impervious. We're not mm. perfect human beings. So we wanted to empower our writers. I think we're also probably the only newsroom in Britain whose writers voted unanimously in favour of their mm. pay deal. Anyone sued you yet? <laughs> um, no, I think we have one angry letter from lawyers... Um, when we, we were actually the first UK media organisation that got into return marketing um, and began the discussion about push polling um, and election fraud expenses, um, scandal that was breaking, and we've got lots more to come on that. Um, but we're happy to take those risks. You know, this uh, is, an, uh, to continue the mining metaphor, mm -hmm. this is a virtually untapped seam, uh, seam rather, the, the extent to which uh, polling is actually now being used to create outcomes mm -hmm. rather than to measure likely outcomes. Uh, the method of questioning, the timing of polls, timing of release, and so on, uh, yeah. in order to create a desired outcome on the part of the person paying for the, for the poll. Completely. Just a suggestion for future investigation. <laughs> um, the form online, only online, that's the future, isn't it? I mean, the, the days of glossy uh, magazines, except in very niche form, is over. Absolutely. That's our aim. That's one thing we wanted to do. Another angle that we took was we operate an online virtual newsroom. So there's no vanity office, you know, yeah. <laughs> where, you know, where we're, you know, we're overlooking beautiful scenes. We've got a virtual online newsroom where all the writers can see each other. Um, every story goes through six editorial gates, which all of the other writers can see. So every single story that gets published by us is actually the collective input, skill and talent of the entire newsroom. Mm. And not many newsrooms operate that way. Mm. And a lot of the feedback we get from the writers, especially those who've worked in the, the established traditional media, mm. is I've never worked in an environment where people cooperated like this. This is new. Mm. You know, normally they're guarding their stories, yes. you know, with their life and, you yes. know, nicking other people's stories. It's so yeah. absolutely quite a brutal, hostile environment Indeed. normally, Indeed. journalism. And, you know, we really identify as a team. Um, people help each other with their stories. We want each other to win and we win or lose together in every respect. Now, uh, you're a poacher now, but you formerly were a gamekeeper. I was. Uh, <laughs> tell the viewers this remarkable journey that you have. Yeah, so I actually, you know, my career began in um, in banking, of all places. And, you know, I went on from, ba you know, banking to be a management consultant and I've run multi-million pound projects across the public and private sector, including, you know, working on the development of Hinkley Point C, which is the new nuclear bill project in Somerset. So I'm not some young, naive, um, you know, kind of lefty who's always mm. been involved in politics. I've been out in the real world and I've, I've been a part of these business operations and seen the way... Um, that they have a fairly chilling, toxic effect on democracy, on our environment, um, and on the way that we approach each other as human beings. And that's what really drove me to change and very much kind of came through the Israel-Palestine um, kind of situation too. And in 2014, I've been travelling out there and reporting for Palestine for 15 years. Um, now, even while I was a banker, I was, really? I was doing really? that. And in 2014, when 
Operation Protective Edge was happening, my readers on Script Tonight Daily actually crowdfunded me to go to Gaza while Operation Protective Edge was happening and so report independently. Under the fire. I was in Gaza for, for sort of three or four <coughs> weeks while Operation Protective Edge was was unfolding and mm. and you know you can't see and those 2, things. Two thousand three hundred and forty one people were being killed. Almost uh, 500 of them uh, children, of yeah. course. Well, um, uh, our uh, guest last week also was. was yes, following. banking is turning out to be <laughs> so quite this a fat trip exactly for this producing <laughs> uh, to radicals. I, I salute that. Uh, finally, you have written a book uh, called Austerity, uh, the Demolition of the Welfare State, and the Rise of the Zombie Economy. I love that title. <laughs> <laughs> zombie <laughs> Economy. Tell us a bit about it, because you mentioned it, austerity being something like fig leaf. It really is. You know, austerity is not temporary and it's not necessary. This is a project that has been taking place around the world um, since the end of World War II, really. And, you know, what you can do, one of the drawbacks, really, in, in journalism when you're doing daily stories is you can only ever give people a small glimpse, sure. you know, a single glimpse of a single issue. And what I wanted to do with the book was tell this story um, of this journey of austerity from the way it impacted the continent of Africa, Latin America, and then arrived on the shores of Europe in 2008 um, and the shores of Britain in 2010. Um, and it, it really is a hostile takeover. You know, yeah. this is what we're seeing. It's a sort of almost like a, an economic coup d'etat. You know, where they don't come with, with guns and bombs, they come with, you know, financial derivatives. Um, and reorient economies away from making things, inventing things, to just supplying financiers through yeah, and gambling. Yeah, yeah, it's just gambling. Who, it's who very published useful. that book? New Internationalist. New Internationalist. American I saw you talking about it on, on Channel 4 News, I think, uh, on one of the news programs anyway. It was uh, truly outstanding. So finally, uh, we can get your book uh, from New Internationalist. Just tell people how they read The Canary. You can find The Canary online, it's www.thecanary.co, and there's no UK or com. Um, and we're there every day producing stories um, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. You'll see mm. our stories going up online, and we've got a Facebook page and Twitter account, so mm. do follow us. It's a must. Kerry Ann Mendoza, thanks for joining us on board the Sputnik. Coming up next, what can happen to whistleblowers when they upset the rich and powerful? The director of the film Redistributors joins us after the break. Welcome back to Sputnik. No less than General Dwight Eisenhower, Allied commander in World War II and two-term president of the United States, warned in his valedictory address of the burgeoning power of the military-industrial complex. Those who profit mightily from wars are, of course, rather keen on more and new conflicts. How to keep a grip on them is an art not much perfected by Western leaders. Or perhaps they just had reasons for not wanting to. The brilliant new British film, Redistributors, goes to dark, dangerous, yet increasingly familiar places. Its director, Adrian Tanner, joins us now on the Sputnik. Adrian, congratulations on the film. I hope it's a fantastic success. Tell us the story and how and why you came to make it. Uh, well, I was a lifelong lover of thrillers, and particularly the thrillers of the 70s, like Three Days of the Condor, great The film. Parallax View, um, uh, Silkwood, and other great conspiracy theory films. And what was always interesting to me is that they tended to have a bit of a left-wing message behind them, the little guy against the government or the corporation or the establishment. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to follow in those footsteps with this film. But I also thought that in a British context where guns are still against the law, it was a bit hard to imagine one of those extreme American scenarios. And how would you find an ordinary London girl in a position where she was actually facing matters of life or death? And I thought if she was a PR girl at a military supply company, then she might be in some real danger if they happened to call in some ex-soldiers who might have had connections with them to come after her. And in the film, it kicks off with a scandal where their equipment has been proven to have led to the deaths of soldiers in Iraq. And uh, she's the one accused of leaking that. So she goes on the run and she hides with her brother, who's a protester and an anti-capitalist hacker, part of this group called the Redistributors, who she meets and learns about and learns to value what they stand for. It's an all too plausible script, if you ask me. You, <laughs> you'll have to go fast to keep up with reality, of course. These uh, kinds of stories are, as I say, all too 
plausible and it's already a big success yeah you've won the best supporting actress uh, award uh in a category that included uh, some really big stars tell us about that well yeah we won a national film award back in april i think uh, and samuel l jackson won the the male equivalent so that was a massive surprise and a real Amazing. boost to the film and uh, we've done a few festivals already the film's sort of on a, a release soon nationally um, and we're hoping to to build on these little little bits of publicity and success to get to the film in front of more people and of course every filmmaker's dream is that it plays on the big screen which uh, is an expensive process to to get underway but we're hoping we have a chance of that now these films of the 70s that you quote uh, uh, particularly for me three days of the condor uh, were epic and helped shape uh, political perceptions for millions maybe far more than millions of people around the world what would be the message that the redistributors movie uh, wants primarily to send? Well, the film was eight years in the making and eight years in the writing. And during that period, I witnessed Occupy and the financial crash. And I witnessed the student protests of 2011. I think a pivotal moment in our history that's perhaps not been expanded, maybe there's a movie to be made, is when that student threw the fire extinguisher off the roof of the Millbank Tower. And perhaps in that one act, he led a generation of young politicised protesters to stay at home. Their parents probably phoned up and said, look, we don't want you going on any more of these protests. It was an incredibly stupid thing to do. It was unfortunate. A, a moment of madness, I think he said in court, but really quite a significant political historical moment. And for me at that time, the film was, uh, you know, was bubbling under. And, and I really wanted to make a film that spoke to that generation of younger student protesters and perhaps dealt with what the future of their political lives might be, which is now much more likely staying at home doing it online because they're scared of yeah. getting out on the streets. This uh, world of hacking and anonymous and uh, all these other groups that do stay at home uh, but nonetheless make a, a big contribution to blowing whistles, uh, is that a significant part of the film? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a level of wish fulfillment in the film and, a, and I hope a level of uh, prediction, which is that uh, Anonymous was a, a very scattergun movement in, in its inception. Some of the people involved by their very nature were quite uh, antisocial types who, who stayed at home. They had some very strange whims in the early days. Uh, one of the early actions of Anonymous was to post flashing GIFs on the a forum for epileptics, which induced epileptic fits, which was done sort of in the name of Anonymous. So they've done some pretty weird things and they've lacked... Well, being coherence. Anonymous, anyone can claim that they are <laughs> yeah, part and anybody of Anonymous. Can, yeah, yeah. And, and there's there's that. So so I, I kind of rebrand them as the redistributors in this film, the title, yeah. eponymous yeah. heroes. And, of course, their activity is much more targeted, much more political. But there's an inherent democratic side to it because when you hack, mostly you use a denial-of-service... Uh, uh, technique which which blocks websites by sending a large amount of traffic to them which is what anonymous do and they've done it in some very good places and very effectively and they're trying to do it to, to Daesh now and, and other things but um, uh, in the film the idea is that you you can't really do this without a democratic support of a lot of people mm -hmm. you share an app which you have on your computer and you don't really need to be a, a, a total nerd with lots of technical knowledge you simply down, download an app put it on your computer and then share it around a lot of people and if all of you are hitting the same target at the same time you can bring about real change and this is how it happens um, in the film we speculate that this might actually start dealing with the vast amounts of hidden wealth and tax evasion wealth in the country by taking it out of accounts in a Robin Hood way and redistributing it to where it's needed. So the film targets the city, the bankers, the establishment. Did you have any resistance uh, in any way um, in making the film, uh, coming from that corner? And can you please tell us a bit more about how the film was made? Well, uh, yeah, the film was uh, a pretty low budget and luckily I didn't have any friends in the city with money, so luckily I can claim that uh, I didn't receive tax evasion money or tax avoidance money, but the, the tax breaks for film are very lucrative and there have been a lot of scandals recently, in fact, just coming to light with quite a few schemes where 
film as one of the, the main sort of areas of tax evasion, in fact, and it's been misused. Arguably, there is a value to it, and I'm sure that the, the mainstream industry is very thankful for, I think, Gordon Brown's sort of tax breaks and various others that make it possible. But in this case, the film was made with independent money and a lot of favours and a lot of youngsters with energy and goodwill and a lot of innovations, I think, that I'm very proud of to do with the technology and the method of filming that made it possible to make a film on a very low budget. Things like filming in public without needing to get permissions and cordon off areas, um, filming with very small cameras that could be moved around very easily, and uh, doing so with a pretty small crew. I actually shot the film myself and directed it, oh. so, you know, I saved on a lot of clobber and manpower by doing that. Um, and that's the future, isn't it? We, I mean, the technology allows, is advancing yeah. at such a rate that the costs of entry into making a film, where once you had to be a multi-millionaire to make a movie, now people like us can make a movie. Yeah. It's not easy. Uh, you do have to put up some of your own money, but with a bit of goodwill, you can get it back. I hope so. I mean, of course, the, there's a danger that, that, that our work will be downloaded for free by people, and uh, that's a reality we have to sort of live with. But. Um, I think, yeah, getting it out there, being able to do it in a cottage industry way, being able to do it without a, a kind of corporate backing is great and uh, gives a voice to a lot of people. I think that the downside of that is that, that a lot of people are entering into this space without enough coherence to their scripts and their message. Um, and there, there is a, a lot of noise in, in the film world at the moment, but I think, um, I hope this film has, has a strong enough story to carry it through. Well, you know, when a thousand flowers uh, are allowed to bloom, of course, some weeds uh, grow too. But that's better than a world where, the world I grew up in, where big Hollywood studios more or less decided which films were ever going to be made. Now, over a cup of coffee after this interview, we could plan both of our next movies. Absolutely, and uh, as long as I think we put in the dedicated paperwork to, to making a coherent written piece that the, the film grows from, I think it, 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 there's every chance of success. I think that, that it is, I, I have kids now who are starting to make films at yeah. 11 years old, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they rush into it without, they can get the technology, they can shoot it on their phones, yeah, but sure. yeah. they need a script and they need a reason. And I think, I'm, I'm very glad that Redistributors is quite a political film because when you're working on something for what's now been nearly 10 years, you have to have a purpose and a reason to carry you through. And for me, very luckily, a lot of what the film's about has become more and more topical yeah, as the process uh, of production's the, gone on. The, that, that proves a quite a significant uh, reality, that although uh, plus a change, uh, in the end, everything remains the same. The issues are the same. They have a different form, uh, but the content is the same. And the content is that the world is ruled by rich and powerful people who are mainly interested in becoming ever more rich and powerful. And if that means the complete abandonment of all morality and ethics, if everything sacred, to quote Marx, uh, is to be profaned, uh, then that obtains 10 years ago, today, and 10 years from now, presumably. Yes, and, the, and the, as a thriller, the redistributor is conventional enough to embrace that in the way that those classic films of the 70s do. And, uh, we deal with corruption, we deal with money, and we're, we're dealing with it in a, a military context where you can well imagine that when a company with many shareholders who's been making its money supplying weaponry and technology to the battlefield is threatened, they have people on speed dial who you wouldn't want mm. coming round your house. So that's what happens in it's the It's a film. fantastic movie, Adrian Turner. Thanks for making it, and thanks for coming on board the Sputnik. Thanks for having me. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So, the rise of alternative media, does mm. that actually mean that the traditional media is dying? Philip Hutchinson says, traditional right-wing media is dying, that's for sure. We do not have to eat the... 
they serve up. Dying but not dead. Uh, and sometimes we overestimate the extent to which it is near death. Uh, so, of course, all power to the new media, but don't imagine that the old media doesn't still have a very powerful position. Just listen to Phil. I haven't bought a newspaper for years. It's wonderful to dispense with the self-appointed gatekeepers. Sure, uh, but the newspapers still come out and they lead the broadcasters. And the main broadcasters are still the mainstream lie machine. That's all the tweets for today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can stay in touch with us on social media, on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik, or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.